Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Social Media Breakfast, for having us here. Um, I am Robert Chappell, uh, not related to Dave Chappelle. Uh, uh, I'm the associate publisher, uh, which means I, I do a lot of writing for uh, Madison 365, and, uh, but I also mm -hmm. run kind of the business side of it, and I'm COO of 365 Media Foundation, which is the nonprofit organization that owns and runs Madison 365. Uh, it also means I am Henry Sanders' um, right-hand guy. When Henry Sanders calls and wants me to do something, I say, okay. Um, tell you a bit more about Henry, but what is Madison 365? Who here does, knows about Madison 365 or has heard of it? Oh, that's so good to see. I'm so happy about that. Uh, but it is nonprofit, which is the short way of saying donations are welcome. Uh, it's free access. Uh, we don't. There's no subscription uh, fees, and we are very, 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 very hesitant to even think about doing like freemium content and stuff like that. We want the content of our stuff to be completely free all the time. We're an online magazine and media platform, meaning um, we view our social media feeds as uh, as content just as much as our website. Uh, and we also have a radio show, which uh, until now has been on WIBA. AM whenever there's not a Brewers game or a Badgers game, uh, which is difficult because we're like, next Tuesday and then the polling Thursday after that, you can tune in. So uh, we are very pleased to announce now that we are moving to 92.1 every Monday, starting uh, October 3rd. Thank you, Shane, for that. <laughs> uh, six to eight uh, every uh, Monday night on 92.1, Madison 365 Radio, and we serve Madison's communities of color. Uh, primarily, we um, uh, my my background in media goes back 27 something years. Um, I started as a village board correspondent with the Mount Horb Mail when I was 15. Um, I just wanted to be a writer. I went down to the office. I said, "Can I write something?" She said, "Here's a meeting," and then she gave me $25. Uh, and I've been. <laughs> I've been in and out of media on the PR side and the, the newspaper and magazine side since then. Um, my intersection of media and race goes back to my junior year of college. I was, um, th there was an um, African American student, fellow student, who had a show on the campus television station. Uh, I was the opinion page editor of the school newspaper. Every, she, every week she tried to do race in America for half an hour. Uh, so she invited me to be on the show, both as the opinion page editor, but also uh, to give my perspective as a biracial man. Um, funny thing, two funny things. First of all, she asked me, what's your nationality? And I said, well, I'm American, I guess. And she said, no, no, no I mean, do you prefer biracial or mulatto? And I was like, okay, first of all, that's not a nationality. But <laughs> the second funny thing is I'm not. I'm white as they come. Uh, my mom's Norwegian, my dad's Cornish. We were born in Iowa County in Dodgeville, you know. Uh, she let me be on the show anyway. Uh, but I, I tell that story only to address the white elephant in the room, that I work for this publication that serves communities of color, and I'm not. Um, so two things about that. First of all, my boss, my best friend, uh, is Henry Sanders Jr., uh, who was supposed to be the first black lieutenant governor that didn't work, didn't work out when we ran that for that a few years ago. Um, and uh, our, all of our interns and uh, our part-time staff and our, a lot of, most of our contributors are people of color. Our, our board of directors might be the only board of directors, nonprofit board of directors in town that, is, that has no white people on it. Um, and, uh, and so I come to this not to speak for people of color, nor do what I ever assume to tell people of color what kind of content they want or what kind of content will work for them. Most of what I've learned about the media reaching people of color, I've learned in the last 12 months from doing this. We just started a year ago. Uh, I have four children, one chocolate, one vanilla, two caramel as I like to say. Uh, so my, my reality is, my everyday reality, waking up in the morning is diverse. Uh, I don't say that to brag, I just say that's, it's, it's my reality. Um, so now that that's out of the way, 
Uh, um, why is it not going? started, uh, we first started talking in December 2014. Uh, we really got going in January 2015 when the um, Madison Times, uh, which is the, the weekly uh, newspaper serving the African American community, was sold to the Milwaukee Courier and really wasn't going to do much local news anymore. The editor there, Dave Dahmer, sort of walked away from it. We snatched him up. Uh, he had been the editor there for 10 years and we got him connected with us. Uh, and uh, we, we just talked and figured stuff out and reached out to the community uh, for several months, and we, and we launched in August of last year. Um, the reason we were successful, we have been successful, is that we saw a need and we filled it. That's pretty much everybody's business model, right? But uh, the thing about Dane County is people of color make up about 20% of the population, about half of the jail population and less than 5% of the media. This is the problem, right? Nationally, people of color make up about 12 to 14% of the media. Here it's way lower than that. And that's, count, that's generous, honestly. That's counting every morning or weekend morning anchor uh, who's a person of color. The State Journal newsroom, 54 people. Full-time staff, all white. Uh, kept times, over 20, all white. Um, they're not racists. They, don't, they, they would like to hire some people of color, but they're having a hard time doing so, and uh, we have some thoughts about that. I won't share them here. Um, so with that, what we are able to do, connecting with communities of color, is we can tell stories that aren't being told in the mainstream press. That includes, that's mostly made up of people of color who are doing wonderful things who don't get recognized for it. When the mainstream media wants to talk to people of color, they call Michael Johnson, Colleen Kerr, Alex G. And those guys then end up being the spokespeople for all people of color, which is not fair to anyone. And in the meantime, there are people out in the world, in the neighborhoods, doing wonderful things that don't get in the paper at all. Uh, so we're able to tell those stories. Uh, but we're also able to do stories like this. Um, last year, you remember the Badgers, uh, Bronson Koenig hit the shot to get him in the Sweet 16. That was fabulous. Um, the next media, the next practice that was open to the media was fully populated with media. They all wanted to talk about basketball. I went, I wanted to talk to him about his tweet that night. He tweeted out, uh, dedicating the win to all my natives out there. Nobody told that story but us. And that was one of our most successful stories of the year in terms of uh, reach and readership. Uh, we also tell the stories that other people are telling, but we tell them from a different perspective. Uh, you remember this? Janelle Laird was arrested violently outside of East Town Mall. Whatever you feel about that, uh, that's how she appeared in the mainstream media. This is how she appeared in Madison 365. It's the same story. It's just a different perspective. The next morning, uh, every black leader you've heard of, most of them, convened at the Urban League uh, to talk about it and to figure out what to do next. And there was no press there but us because they didn't know about it. You know, it just had, they didn't purposely shut it out. They're just not connected to the community in the way we are. Uh, so we heard about it, we went and we reported on it. Um, 
our reach and impact uh, is, we, we, we say when we talk to funders and other people that we reach about 350,000 people a month. That's, that's a very conservative number. Um, I just checked our Facebook insight this morning where for the past 28 days, we're like 420,000. Um, I honestly, you know, I'm not sure if that's an impressive number to you guys or not. It seems cool to me. Uh, <laughs> we, we started, you know, our first, well, I'll tell you this. We launched in August. We had no idea what was going to happen. We had about 200 likes on Facebook before we launched, just because Dave knows everybody on Facebook. Um, Dave, our editor. And um, our first month, we had 10,000 unique visits to the site. September, we had 100,000. Uh, the second month, and we had to upgrade the server like four times in a weekend. Uh, uh, and it, it's the and like I said, we don't count only um, you know Unix to the site. We count every touch because that's really important that people see their own voice and their own community represented wherever they get their news. Um, so that's that's the, the 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 conservative number that we use. Um, we have a, a I don't expect you to. There's not going to be a quiz, okay? But um, the, uh, our, you, the age range is really spread out, which people find surprising for an online media platform. Uh, we're, most, we're just barely mostly married. We're just barely mostly female. Uh, and we're two-thirds on mobile device, which is not surprising to me. Um, we're geographically pretty spread out. We're mostly Madison-Dane County, obviously. Uh, we have a really strong presence in Milwaukee. Uh, we're, um, you know, a little bit in Fox Valley, but um, spread out around Wisconsin and the Midwest. Um, we have really desirable advertising demographics. We're mostly college educated. We're mostly affluent, relatively speaking, homeowners. Um, my favorite metric really is engagement because this is where we're beating everybody. Uh, engagement, obviously, on, yeah, I'm just talking about Facebook for right now because that's the most, that's sort of the easiest to measure. Um, but we, 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 engagement tells you how much people care about your stuff, not just how many see it. And this is an example. Um, the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism is a nonprofit outfit at the UW J School that pr provides really terrific content for media outlets. Um, they did a story on the education gap and the achievement gap, the black and white achievement gap, and some young people it, from Madison Memorial who were succeeding despite the achievement gap. Um, the Capital Times ran it on their cover on a Wednesday. We ran it the same day online, obviously. Um, they put it on Facebook. They had, at this point, this is December, they had about 15,000 likes on their page. We had about 3,000. Um, they put the story up. They, uh, they got, as, I don't know if you can see it, but it got shared twice and it got liked 25 times. Um, I'm going to pause here and take a little tangent. Uh, you notice the headline, Failing Another Generation. That was the headline on their cover. Uh, I'm a white guy. That didn't phase me. I didn't notice that that was a problematic headline. Okay? My boss, Henry, was like, man, I can't believe the headline. I said, what? What do you mean? He said, they put the word failing right next to a black man's face. Like, that's something that as a white guy, I would not have noticed. Okay, and that's one thing I'm learning, <laughs> that you've got to be a little more careful about that stuff. Anyway, back to engagement. We ran literally the same story at almost the same time with 20% of the likes, uh, and we got 250 shares, 116 likes, and 19 comments. Our people really dug this story because it affirmed what they knew about the achievement gap, and it highlighted some young kids of color who were achieving despite it. I chose that picture because that kid played soccer with my kid. So. <laughs> um, if you look at engagement per post, the only uh, media sites that are beating us are the television stations, because that's why we're going to start doing video more. Um, so that's, that's basically a, just a quick overview of Madison 365 and what we do. Um, I want to talk a little bit about new journalism, uh, which is a, kind of a fancy term for something that's been happening forever and ever called community journalism. Uh, new journalism 
is community focused, meaning it's local in most cases. If it's not local, it's um, specific to a specific community, even if that community is nationwide, Latino, African American, LGBT, whatever it is. The, the journalism is focused on a specific community. The, the up and coming um, media outlets that are gonna survive are like Voice of San Diego, Texas Tribune, Men Post, that are real specific to a specific community. And that's the only reason the Cap Times is still going strong, is because they made a very conscious decision to, to focus on local issues and be the Madison community newspaper, which is was a very smart decision they made several, um, several years ago. Uh, it's fair, we are fair, we are real life journalists, we're not, we're fair, we're not fair and balanced, we are fair, but we are not necessarily objective. What I mean by that is two things. First of all, but some officials said Mr. the criticism of Mr. Hitler was unfounded. False balance is pervasive in old journalism. And old school journalists are actually still putting, pushing, pushing against, back against this now. You see in climate change, uh, you see about vaccinations, you'll see 98 scientists say climate change is real. Two don't, but they got to quote one of each as if those are equivalent positions, right? So false balance, we don't do false balance. That's one thing. Um, <clears throat> but the other thing is we approach things fairly and without a conclusion in mind, but we approach it with a perspective. And that's okay. This is the example. You guys remember when Maurice Cheeks was supposed to ascend to the presidency of the Common Council. He was the vice chair. He was the nominee to be president. Uh, it was supposed to be a smooth transition. Um, and it went off the rails. In the two weeks leading up to the vote, uh, the mainstream media very fairly and objectively reported what happened. There were 15 ballots. The, uh, you know, went through a bunch of machinations and motions and things, and Mike Verveer re you know, was, got voted as the new president for the third time. Uh, everybody else stopped there. Uh, but we, in our non-objectivity, said, what happened here? Nobody wanted to mention the fact that Maurice was supposed to be the first African-American council president since 1994, and only the second in history, because they were being objective. We can't mention that. That's not objective. But we asked, and we found out, and we found out that the mayor did it. And the mayor wasn't fully truthful with me when I asked him about it. So we reported that. We came at that with agenda, may, might not be the best word, but you know, we came up with a perspective. We had to um, ask a different set of questions than the old type of journalism would ask. Uh, new journalism is viewed, views itself as a public good, which is why the best journalism the most successful journalism going forward is going to be nonprofit. Journalists have viewed themselves as public servants forever and ever. Um, they they view they typically view, especially sort of daily newspaper people. They are they're they're digging at the truth. We're going to tell the truth. We're going to hold the state accountable. They're the fourth estate. They're going to, uh, and that's been great. Their bosses, the owners of the newspapers, have been primarily driven by profit and have not necessarily viewed their, themselves as a public service. Everybody, top to bottom, in new journalism, views, views themselves as doing good for the world. We are telling stories, we're telling truths, but we're serving social justice as we do it. So therefore, what that means, what that leads to naturally is nonprofit journalism is the future. Uh, new journalism is aware of and comfortable in its context. And here's what I mean by that. We uh, gathered 10 high school students over the summer for our first Madison 365 Academy to, uh, to try to offer some students of color just a taste of journalism, because none of them had ever seen anybody like them on TV or in the newspaper, so it hadn't occurred to them to, that they could be journalists, so we gave them an opportunity. It was wonderful. Uh, and one of them is still coming back for our college program this fall, and I'm so excited. 
Um, but I asked them, so where do you guys get your news? Thinking, uh, CNN, State Journal, MSNBC, Facebook was the answer, right? You guys know this. New journalism, uh, new journalists understand that and are okay with it, that the, the, the hard-hitting expose that I've dedicated the last six months of my life to is gonna show up right after what Uncle Bob had for breakfast <laughs> and right before, like, number six will shock you, you know? <laughs> old, old school journalists are upset about this. They don't want that. They want you to have to read the paper and they want to be lauded or whatever. And there was a, actually, a, a, I can't remember where it was now, but there was a very crusty and cranky editorial about, it's not content, it's journalism. And it just, it's, it just flabbergasts me that somebody would be so upset about that. It, yeah, it is content. Journalism is a type of content. Sorry, guys. It's, 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 fair and object, you know, fair and not, not objective, but and it's a content that takes a lot of time and effort and energy and does a lot of good in the world, but it's still content. And it's still going to be flowing through the feed like every other piece of content. And that is okay. That's where we can reach people. That's where people are getting, learning about their world. And that's just fine. Transitioning to our specific audience, New journalism applies in many ways. As I said, there's several great nonprofit publications, mostly online, that serve a particular local community, like Voice of San Diego is a great example. They serve the San Diego community really, really well. Um, we have nichified ourselves further, saying we're serving Dane County, we're serving Madison, but we're serving Madison's people of color. Uh, and so that, what, one of the things I'm trying to help you guys do today is figure out how to reach them the way we are reaching them because it's important. It's important from a social good perspective, obviously. That's, that's where our heart is, is we're trying to not only lift up the stories and tell the stories of people of color that aren't being told and to tell, give people a voice who haven't had a voice before, um, but we're also trying to bridge the gaps and this is one of the reasons we've been so successful is we're actually bridging the gaps between communities. Madison Times, Capital City Hughes, uh, La Voz Latina, La Comunidad, all serve their own communities really, really well. We don't want to replace them, okay? What we're doing is we're, we're taking, we're building bridges between their, their audiences and sort of the mainstream press audience. So we're getting dialogue going back and forth. We're creating conversations that are sometimes uncomfortable. Uh, but to reach, the, but, but the people we're reaching, as I told you, are demographically desirable to you, probably, if you're trying to sell something. Uh, but the business case for this, so we're looking at the increase in buying power during the aughts, 2000 to 2013. The increase, the, the, the white person buying power has increased 63% in that 13 year period. Every other ethnicity has grown faster than that. Okay, if you're not reaching these folks, you're leaving money on the table. It is estimated that non-white buying power will be four and a half trillion dollars next year. There's a lot of money to leave on the table there if you're not reaching people, okay? So how do you, how do we? I can tell you how we do, and I can give you a little bit of advice on how you can. Uh, here are three things that you assume about people of color, if you're white, that are wrong. You gotta get over these assumptions first, okay? First, you assume that they're not online. I've heard this. Uh, we had, I, was, I worked at a, a nonprofit, another nonprofit was trying to sell some tickets at a discount to reach people of color, reach people that, to reach underrepresented audiences. And someone, honest to gosh, said, we can't do this online, these people don't have computers. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, they're online. They're on their phones, they're on their computers, they're in an office, they have 
jobs with a computer at the job. So don't, don't assume that you can't reach people online, okay? Uh, there's an assumption that they only care about racial issues. This is, the, this is a problem, one of the problems in the mainstream press, that the coverage of race is separate but equal. When you, when, on the rare occasion that you do see a person of color on the cover of a, of a, or on the front page of a newspaper or a magazine, it's a story about race. Okay? Isthmus recently had a person of color on the cover in a story about entrepreneurship. He was an entrepreneur who was also African American. That's where we got to get. Okay? If you're a golf club and you want to attract more people of color to your golf club, you don't have to do a big thing about all the work you're doing for racial justice. You just find a way to find the black people who like to play golf. All right? Uh, and the third assumption you have that is wrong <clears throat> is that equity means equivalence. If you've ever said out loud, I don't see race, this is you, okay? We're all the human race, okay? Uh, equity is what we're all working for. I don't want to hear you say, oh, but we're all the same. No. You can be equal, you can be equitable, and still be different. One of the wisest things I ever heard 20 years or so ago when I was in college was from the, the multicultural student services person there was that we all want America to be a melting pot, right? And we say that, we white people say that because we want everybody just, this is great if you all just melted into what we like. <laughs> you just kind of melt into us, what we do, right? America's a salad bowl, come on. You can keep the tomatoes and the lettuce and the kohlrabi, and they can all keep their identity as vegetables, <laughs> or as ingredients, while also coming together to make something great. So the message that you send to the lettuce has to be different than the message you send to the tomato, or you're not going to reach the tomato, OK? That doesn't mean the tomatoes are less important. You just have to, you, you know, it's OK. It's necessary to tailor your content and your messages to different audiences, right? Uh, so to do that, once you've gotten over those assumptions, good job, congratulations to you. Uh, your content, if you're using content to market, which is what we do, so that's what I'm here to talk to you about, uh, it must be two things. It must be authentic, okay? We can tell if you're faking it. And it must be relevant. This is true for whoever you're trying to reach, right? But people forget this, I think, when they're trying to reach people of color. You guys remember this? I, some of you might be newer in town, but you see the black guy there? He wasn't there. OK, that's um, Diallo Shabazz is his name. He is a campus activist. He never attended a football game in his whole time at UW. And they photoshopped his face <laughs> onto the application brochure <laughs> to seem, because well, we have diversity. We just don't have a picture of it. <laughs> so we had to make a picture. This is not authentic. <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> uh, authenticity doesn't mean that you have to become a person of color. But if you're white, you got to talk white. You got to be yourself, OK? This story. This is the story that crashed our server three times in a weekend. This was uh, a month in. This is on a weekend. Uh, Dave Dahmer put this story up on a Friday. I was literally in church on my phone upgrading the server because it was crashing <laughs> so bad. Um, but this is called, it's the harsh truth about progressive cities. Dave Dahmer is a white guy. Tim Wise, one of the leading uh, voices on race and race issues in this country, is also a white guy. This is a story of two white guys talking to each other about race. And that's OK, only because they didn't pretend to be anything else. OK, and the story was uh, Madison, Minneapolis, Austin, Portland, and San Francisco, all painfully liberal cities who brand themselves as tolerant, have the worst racial disparities in the nation. Why is that? Okay, 
this story, um, this was a Twitter story. And it, it didn't do all that well on Facebook, but it crashed the site because uh, Tim Wise has a lot of people on Facebook, I think. Or on Twitter, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, point here being, it was authentic in its, you know, nobody pretended to be anything they weren't, okay? Obviously, must be relevant. Uh, this is a story, this is our second biggest story ever on Facebook. Um, this is relevant. It's not a story about racial justice. It's not a story about anything big and deep. It's the Madison Public Library. Uh, got an award from the First Lady. Uh, and this is relevant to our people, to our my audience, or our audience, uh, because Rob D's got to meet Michelle. Everybody loves Rob D's. He went and he met Michelle, and he got a picture. That's awesome. It's local. It's somebody they know, it's somebody they've heard of. Uh, and it's Michelle. Um, this is a, another story that, that, this one surprised us at how well it did on Facebook especially. Um, remember last, uh, last fall, some folks um, organized this Dia Sin Latinos. Uh, it was a protest, uh, it was a really good one. Um, and this was the morning of the protest, this was before the protest. But it was relevant, it, I, th I think my theory is that it did well because, I mean, we posted it at a good time in the morning, so we got lucky a little bit. But also, uh, it's something local. It's something I can do. It's something I can do today. There's sort of a call to action implicit in this. I don't know how many of our readers actually went to it, but it's something they could do. And it's something they wanted their friends to know about. Like, hey, we should go to this, or you should go to this, or I can't make it, but you should go to this. Okay, it's, it's relevant in that it's immediate. And it's local, and it's doable. You're not asking them to do it. You're asking them to walk up to the Capitol for an hour, right? How can you be authentic and relevant? It's going to be very hard for you if your marketing team looks like this, all white, right? Uh, the besides just being authentic to yourself and figuring out the different kind of content that different people will respond to, it is critical that this not be normal to you, OK? That's my eldest child. I made him put on a Madison 65 shirt. <laughs> Very early one morning, that's why his hair is weird. Uh, he's the only black person in his class in Mount Horeb. Uh, he's, I think, one of only two or three black kids in the high school. In middle school, when they started talking about slavery, every time slavery came up in history class, everybody was kind of like, <laughs> you okay? What do you think about this? And he's like, I don't know. I made him watch Glory when he was eight. That's the only thing he knows about slavery. Uh, but don't do that, okay? If you, if you do manage to bring a person of color into your marketing team, don't make that person write your ads for people of color. <laughs> you might not be an ad writer, <laughs> okay? And you can't be like, hey, help us speak to your people. <laughs> okay, don't do that. <laughs> That's not authentic either. <laughs> and <laughs> only marginally relevant. Uh, what you have to do, that, but having a person of color in the room will do several things, one of which is it'll just kind of help check your authenticity. You can't, you can't have, it, have your people of color messaging approved by the one person of color in the room, okay? However, the conversation could be different. It can have a slightly different lens. You can look at the issue, look at your product, look at your marketing with a, just, a, just a different lens for a minute. But also, Make diversity normal around you. Uh, you may remember, and I, I hate to pick on the Capital Times, but you may remember the Capital Times a month or so ago was speculating about who might run for governor from the Democratic side. They put 12 perfectly qualified candidates on the cover, and I saw immediately they were all white. So of course we did our response two days later. Of the, They had 12 white people, we had 13 people of color who could also run for governor. <laughs> Didn't try to one-up them by one, but we did. Uh, 
the, the point is, in an all-white newsroom and an all-white political party who is feeding them these names, all-white is normal. In my family, all-white is not normal. So I noticed it. If your marketing team is all-white, you're not going to notice necessarily when your messages are missing. If, you're, if you just surround yourself with people of color a little bit, then you'll start to notice. And diversity will look a little more normal. And you'll be able to look at the world through that lens a little bit more. You'll be able to uh, see normal differently. You'll be able to reach people. You'll be able to be authentic. You'll be able to be relevant. Now, I talked about that a lot faster than I thought I was going to. So I guess it's time for questions. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, a lot of companies will bring in a, a diversity expert, but then it doesn't go anywhere. Um, I, without a specific example, I would say that that might go awry because there's a lack of authenticity in the effort. If there's an idea like, oh, geez, we've got to get more diverse, I guess. Let's do this. Um, if, then it, it's not going to work. It has to be an authentic effort. It has to be like authentically. No, seriously, we have to be more diverse, you guys. I, we want to be diverse. I'll give credit. There's a, I, I, maybe I shouldn't name check the company, but there's a company in town who tried to start a diversity blog. And they were like ready to do it. And they were trying to write it. And they were like, whoa, we're all white. <laughs> Why are we writing a diversity blog? And they just pulled the plug on it. So we, we, just, we can't do that authentically. So let's not do it. So if you're not going to do it authentically, don't do it. Um, and I think, to answer your question, if it's not happening, it's because the effort's not authentic. One argument I hear is, um, well, we can't find any qualified yeah. applicants. We can't find qualified applicants. <laughs> Where are you looking? Are you using Madison 365 job listing service? <laughs> uh, that's what we heard from the mainstream media, that we just don't, we, that we just don't have any. Right. Right, well, that's what they say. But I, who knows where they're looking. Cap Times would even tell us where they're looking. Um, I think that's, I think there's a, there's a, it's glib for me to say, well, just look harder. Because you, you have to attract people to live in Madison, which is not a, the, the hottest thing right now. Um, I don't, I'm not a, a staffing solutions person, so <laughs> I don't have a great answer for you, other than be serious and authentic about broadening your search and being more creative in your search. And in just, I don't think you need to hire if there's 10 applicants and one of them is a person of color, you don't have to hire that person of color. You have to get more than one applicant in those 10. That's where you start. And you start that by being more creative and more broad about um, your search, which could start with Madison 365's job listing service. <laughs> yes, sir. Sure. Uh, the question is, how, is about us building bridges between communities. I, I wouldn't, um, and how we're doing that. It, I wouldn't say we're building a bridge between the mainstream media and the niche media. I think we're building the bridge between the audiences of those things. Okay. Um, we are very friendly with the mainstream media. We have a content sharing arrangement with Channel 3000. Um, they love our diversity content. We love their breaking news because we don't have big enough staff yet to be out doing the breaking news. Um, uh, John Smalley, the State Journal, loves us. And, um, uh, but the, the way, to answer your question, the way we are bridging the gaps, um, well, that's a good question. 
now that I think about it, like how are we doing that? I, I think we're I think we're doing it just by being intentional, but that's what we meant to do from the very beginning. So it or happens a little bit organically, um, and that our content is is um, of a broad enough appeal that there are some stories that resonate completely with the communities of color. There are some that rep that resonate completely with white guilt liberal Madison. <laughs> And there are some that, that resonate with just your average state journal reader. Um, the other thing we are aware of is that um, our audience, typically, no matter who they are, is not reading the mainstream press very much at all. That includes white people, people of color, old people, young people. So we're just filling up a space that they just weren't in before. So does that make sense? I think there's one in the back. Did you? Go ahead. Yep. So, yeah. Um, that's not a local. That's a that's a national figure. Um, and I got that off of our sponsorship brochure, which I got it from somewhere else for that. I can't remember now what it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Yes, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, and it made the integration of that a lot easier. I'm curious, did you guys hear that in the Princeton article? And if what results have you seen? We actually haven't yet. Um, we're, we, we're aware of it and we're going to, um, primarily because, um, as I said before, we don't, like, traffic to our site, to, to madison365.org, is not necessarily our favorite metric. Like, we just want to. We want to get you the information. We want you to receive it. We want you to feel that your voice is heard, that an underrepresented voice is heard. I don't care if you hear that, on, if that's on Facebook or on the radio show or at our site. So from that perspective, yes, it's something we're going to do. We are we're doing a thousand other things at the same time, so we haven't yet. But, but yes, absolutely we will. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Thank you. Uh, being a naval organization. Uh, second, I'd love to know, what do you all need to make your next you know, move, your, a year old, what are you trying to accomplish in year two? That uh, need more of? Money. <laughs> uh, the, the, next, the next steps, really, are um, to, are, the long-term goal, I should say, is to develop a crop of young people of color who are journalists, or old people of color, for that matter. Uh, to diversify the media in this town and in this state. You do that two ways. You actually integrate the current mainstream newsrooms, and you build your own newsroom that is full of people of color. Okay, we want to do both of those. We don't want to be separate but equal. We want to do both of those things. Uh, so we have our academy program that is uh, about in a uh, week and a half. We'll start it's co the college program with some college interns. We're paying those people. We're paying, we paid our high school kids over the summer. We're paying our, uh, with both cash and scholarships. Um, and then uh, come, can't announce it yet, but we're gonna be able to actually hire some writers. We respect the profession of journalism enough to pay people. Uh, we haven't been able yet to pay everybody as much as we want, but we will. That's our, that's our goal. Um, we're also looking to expand geographically. We're trying to get more news out of Milwaukee, Chicago, the Fox Valley. Um, and uh, we're looking to, um, to broaden the, the media, the, the, the channels that we get to. you, And all of that takes money. I mean, it's, just, it's a capital question, as you all know. Uh, so to do that, we're ex we're really investing in our job listings that I mentioned a few times. <laughs> um, we are uh, we're reaching um, out to communities of color to try to put forward people who they think who who either want to be journalists or haven't thought of being a journalist before, uh, or who 
want to be journalists but don't feel like they want to be the only one at the State Journal, I want to give them a voice. Um, and again, all that takes energy, time, capital. What else? Yes. A, a different network, a completely different network, yeah. Right, right, thank you for that. And that answers your question. That, uh, just to repeat that, uh, one way to broaden your pool of applicants to include more people of color is to put a person of color or two on your search committee. When you're writing the job, when you description, when you're writing the job ads, when you're reaching out to different networks, um, that's a great way to start. Yes. Uh-huh. It really puts all the onus on you that you can see and you do something. Completely. And and that's what where we run into things sometimes is people want Madison Duke sixty five to be their Jesse Jackson. That if you apologize to Jesse Jackson, you're good, you're fine. <laughs> and <laughs> so people want to use us for cover sometimes and you want you might want to use your one personal color in your office as cover. Don't do that. That's not authentic. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's a tough one. The question is, is it, are people of color, you're asking, more online, mobile versus desktop? Um, we, we weren't able to find really great data on that. Anecdotally, um, our assumption was that, at least in, when Henry, my boss, has been in the, he's from Madison East and Vera Court. Uh, lifelong Madisonian, and, and his first thing was like, everybody's on this. So everybody in his network was mobile. Two thirds of our readers are coming to our site on a, coming to either our Facebook feed or our site on mobile devices. Not all of our readers are people of color. They're not necessarily representative. I would, though, just generally speaking, assume mobile. And then it'll still work for desktop, you know? Yes. We really don't know. The question is, what are our racial demographics? And that's the one thing Facebook doesn't tell you about the race of your people. Um, we, I think we are about, I think just anecdotally, based on our engagement, I think we're about half white. Yes? Ah, <laughs> what tips do we have? To reach out, it, so so you want you want to get the racist customers too. <laughs> well, I think you just gave me the idea for my next big story. <laughs> I might have to do a little investigating on that. I, I think, um, boy, it, it, I guess it depends on the outcome you want. If you just want to make the sale and move on, I would say you know try not to engage. Um, But if you don't want to, like, yeah, or 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 make them just right, 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 and you don't want to make them endure something that they shouldn't have to endure. You don't want to have to be like, okay, just be the good one, you know, <laughs> be the nice one. Don't you don't want to make them do that? Boy, that's that's a really tough question, um, and it's probably not a question that I'm particularly qualified to answer. Um, but what I, I'm serious, that's actually a great idea for a story. And that what I might do actually is, um, I can already think of, I know who I'm going to talk to. Uh, I, I don't know, like two or three people that I can talk to on that very issue. Like, how do you handle it when a customer is clearly racist, but you have to make the sale and maintain your dignity? So I would say check madison365.org in about two weeks. <laughs> And I'm sorry I can't. I'm sorry I don't have a great answer right now. Any other questions? Uh, I've got nowhere to be till 11, so if anybody wants to chat, that's fine. But otherwise, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today here at Social Media Breakfast. Don't forget, next month uh, we will be back at Turner Hall. And uh, we will have Laura Pierce, uh, Grow Your Business, How Your Website and Social Media uh, 
can be the perfect collaboration. So she's going to give you 10 tips on how you can tune up your website just in time for the holidays as well. Thanks, everybody.